Hi everyone, and welcome to The Milk of the Matter. Today we have with us Mrs. Nicole Foster, who is going to talk about her career and how she has integrated law and health, as well as her life as a mother and her experiences with breastfeeding and complementary feeding. Thanks so much for joining us today, Nicole. You're welcome, Alison. <laughs> you have done so much work, Nicole. I mean, you are extremely experienced. So I'm just going to run through a few things because I think people have to have context and they have to know who you are. Um, so I know that you are a lawyer. Oh. Right, and you graduated from the University of the West Indies. I know that you also did master's in law at Cambridge University as well. Yeah. And I now have to look at my list of things, other things that you've done. You're a former diplomat. Yeah. Um, and you acted actually on an international panel of legal experts on the UNESCO Convention on Doping in Sports. Yeah, that's a very recent appointment, yes. R right, okay. And I mean, that's really interesting. Very different. I, I, yes, very, very different. different. <laughs> um, I know that you're a consultant with PAHO. Um, and you work with them in, in non-communicable diseases, non-communicable diseases and mental health um, in the sub-regional office here in Barbados. Yeah, a few years ago, I, I, right. I was attached to that, that right. section. Okay. Um, and then I know that at one point you were Deputy Dean of the University of the West Indies. I know you don't hold that appointment anymore. Yes, two and a half years. Two and a half years. What was... Including during COVID, which was, you know, that's a whole story all on its own. Right, okay. Um, but I know that currently you are, you still head, you are the founder, actually, of the Law and Health Research Unit at University of the West Indies. Yes, yeah, so in 2021, um, as part of its delayed due to COVID um, 50th anniversary celebrations, the faculty would have launched a, its Law and Health Research Unit, which I head. And uh, the idea, the, 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 the raison d'etre for mm -hmm. the unit came from me. So it's my blood, sweat, and tears. Your baby. There. Absolutely. So, my so passion speak. project, as right. I like to yeah, say. So to speak. Okay. I guess I wanted to talk, before we get into law and health, and really, because I'm sure people listening are probably thinking, huh? Like, yeah, <laughs> like, I get that a lot. Like, <laughs> like glaze over probably not, that they don't have anything to do with each other. I wanted to hear your... Your story, a little bit of your story about, because we are the Breastfeeding and Child Nutrition Foundation, um, and we want to we want to find out from you what was your experience like actually when you when you breastfed your kids? Did you breastfeed your kids? Okay, so I have two boys. One right. is fourteen, the other is um, fourteen, almost fifteen. I, I should add that, Keep that right? Made that clear, right? Yeah. And the other is ten, and and so yes, I did breastfeed. Um, I must say it was a challenge. Okay. Um, so with my first child, which I would have had, so by the time I had my first child, I was well advanced in my career. And, um, you know, I'm reliably informed by my pediatrician that as career people sometimes don't make the adjustment very well, well right, in yeah. terms of, I you know, say, that space I would say I of having kids at that age then. Right. Um, and, and so I was committed to breastfeeding. I was like, yeah, I'm going to breastfeed, you know, you know, breast is best and all right. of that. And I just was not prepared for how isolate, how, how lost I felt. Let me put it that way. Hmm. Because, um, okay, so I delivered at QEH, which of course is a breastfeeding friendly hospital. Mm -hmm. So they would have told me if any time I came in, you know, don't bring bottles, don't bring formula, whatever, we're gonna start you breastfeeding. And they showed me how to latch on and all of those things. Thought I had it down pat, thought, <laughs> being the <laughs> operative word. And I go home. Well, what happened initially was that I realized, even though they, I had been told that he was latching on well, he wasn't actually latching on that well. Mm -hmm. So he you was in pain. So, so I was a little bit sore. Not right. nothing excruciating, but he wasn't latched on as well as he should have to really be 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 um, uh, breastfeeding properly. Mm -hmm. And so I, even my husband, I joke about it now, you know, the ride home, you know, every pothole that the car dropped in because I was <laughs> breastfeeding him as we were going, oh, you're like, ah, ah, ah. He's like, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, That's but, funny. But the real challenge, but the, the hospital and everything, that was fine because, of course, you have nurses around and, mm -hmm. but um, I wasn't prepared for how lost I felt in terms of not 
being capable, right? So mm -hmm. this was an unfamiliar space to me. I didn't know what entailed, and I, the assumption was that you sort of just know it, right? You just it, get it. It, it, it just happens, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. It's like magic. Your mother, and they put them on the breast, and, and they, they just feed. Yep. And there are no issues. Of course, my, I, I must say, I had had a, my younger sister had had a child before I did, and she had had um, engorgement of her breasts and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I knew that it could be challenging in terms of those sorts of things. You know, you can yeah. have little issues there, but I didn't think, like, as me as a mother, in terms mm -hmm. of just making that connection and doing the mechanics of what needed to you be didn't done, think you'd have that, that challenge. any challenges. Yeah. And I was at home. Um, so I had I'd taken leave from work, so I'm off for six months because I'd taken an extra three months off the the UV where I work right. allows you to take an extra three months in addition to this the, is paid leave. No, unpaid okay. leave. Okay, but okay. I had that conversation with my husband. I'm taking my six months. Right, okay. you sorted it out <laughs> in terms of, of that extra um, right. three months because I thought that would be important in terms of making Absolutely. the adjustment with him being my first child, mm -hmm. and I really. My son cried all the time. Mm. It drove me nuts. First thing is, I must confess, I felt a little bit like a cow. I tell people <laughs> this, that, right? So I'm like, my life just revolves around feeding this child. And for moving from somebody who is accustomed, you know, I set my own agenda, I go mm -hmm. and do what I, I move when I want to move, I do what I need to do, I, you mm -hmm. know, I'm always engaged in different things. And then I'm home all day. Mm -hmm. And my purpose in life is to feed this child, yeah. literally, That's right? Yeah. I just felt like a cow, right? Yeah. I just wake up, I feed him, I, you know, you're supposed to rest when the baby resting, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. I'm like, I'm doing, you know, like, so I was feeling a little frustrated there. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I'm feeding him and, you know, I used to have to take him off the breast. Because mm -hmm. I used to tell him he, he liked to hang out there or something. He thought it was a hangout spot. So right? what do you mean he spent a long oh, time, time that you were anticipating was, okay, on the breast? Okay. And I'm like, you got to be finished eating though, right? Yeah. It can't be like, we've been here for a while. Yeah. And he would cry all the time. And mm. it got to a stage, I mean, I would be in tears because... I've just finished feeding you. I just fed you. I mean, literally just fed you. Mm -hmm. We spent a while at it. It was not a quick something. Yeah. And you're crying. And, you know, you're not wet. You're not there. I'm like, you cannot be hungry. You mm -hmm. cannot be hungry. Yeah. And I remember I lived, I literally lived for the pediatrician visit. Okay. That was the only, because, you know, you feel you must be doing something. I just felt lost, as I said. But, I, I just felt lost. But did you get the support that you needed when you went to the pediatrician's office? Did you, what so, advice did you get? So I didn't speak to the pediatrician specifically about breastfeeding, I must mm -hmm. confess. No, I did a little bit because we spoke about, um, you know, I was just saying, you know, he's crying all the time. And mm -hmm. We would have discussed different options in terms of m maybe we might need to supplement or whatever. Mm -hmm. But. We didn't have a very, I was just needing that reassurance from a professional that I wasn't a bad, you know, that I hadn't just mucked you up the whole, the, wrong. The, the whole yeah. thing. He's growing okay, he's mm -hmm. putting on weight, and he was doing fine. Yeah. Um, but it was really when I was at home, and, and I really did not, I mean, I wish we had something with your group when I had yeah, your heart. I, I get that because a lot. Because I would have loved to have had just that, that sense of community mm -hmm. and support. I remember looking through the, the, the cause we realized, okay, we need some sort of like formal mm -hmm. advice now on how to breastfeed. Am I doing it correctly? You know, mm -hmm. what, how do I manage this very challenge, mentally challenging space? And I remember, I. I, I didn't know where to turn. I'm looking in the yellow book, right? Yeah. The yellow pages. And I, I can't figure out who to call or what what's the resource that I can use. Willing to pay, yeah. you know, but just not knowing. And I didn't manage to, you know, find, you I think somebody someone. did some private nursing. Okay. And she came to the house a few times. And that was just such a relief to not feel alone, mm -hmm. to feel that sense of reassurance that there's somebody who knows what they're doing. And so yeah. they're going to show me the right way to do this, right? Because I'm a very rules-based person. It must be to do with being a lawyer. So I need to know that I'm doing it correctly. And, yeah. and so she was able to tell me um, he's not latching on properly, you know, you, right. you know, try to help me with that. But even then I found that he would still, as I said, I found to me, it seemed mm -hmm. at the time that he just needed to 
to feed way too often and, and, so, and too long. <laughs> so what? So so my question to you is then, would you say that that was a negative experience? Yes. You're, you're, so and I know because the thing is he latched on. There's some moms that don't even get the babies to latch on to the breast. So you got him to latch on, but in the end, you realize after this person came and gave you advice, you realize that all this time, you were, you were getting this information, you were going to the pediatrician or you were going to whoever you went to, and all this time he wasn't latched on well. How did that make you feel in terms of going into the second pregnancy now? Okay, so um, as I said, I still struggled with him. Even though he was latching on, I still had the challenge of somehow, I know in retrospect we're thinking maybe I, my milk wasn't, wasn't in. In, in sufficiently. Mm -hmm. um, but I was getting milk out, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. when I would pump, initially when I so was pumping, pumping as well. I, I was right. pumping and, and, and the whole mm -hmm. stuff was gushing, right? And I thought, <laughs> yes! And so, but we're thinking maybe it mm -hmm. wasn't um, as much as we had initially thought. But I will say that for my second child now, I didn't even realize I had, I, I say I had post-traumatic stress. Right? Really? But I did not even realize it. Okay. I just know that was a dark period in my life because he, I was, I was just frustrated and upset and at my wits end. I'm like, mm. you know, I go out with you and you know I've just fed you and you're crying. You know, it's just, and I can't fix it, right? Because mm -hmm. I can't keep you attached to me forever. So, yeah. and and so with my second child now, what I didn't realize, and and the funny thing is there was a complete difference in the pregnancy. So my mm. first child was very challenging, that pregnancy, like I said, he cried a lot, he was up a lot, he beat me up, mm -hmm. whatever. My, my youngest was like a totally star, different. right? <laughs> a complete star. <laughs> and notwithstanding that, that was my most challenging pregnancy okay. because, because of the breastfeeding experience, right? right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm still committed to exclusively mm -hmm. breastfeeding, right? right? We kinda know how to do this now. And but still, I, I didn't realize I had residual, like I said, I say post-traumatic stress, yeah, right? Yeah. So I was just anxious. Mm. I was just anxious not realizing I was anxious. And so it got to the stage that like, I didn't want to, I just felt overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And even though he was a very easy baby, mm -hmm. very, very easy. And that just added to my frustration because I'm like, I should be managing this better because I know compared to my first pregnancy, this, a this is a breeze, yeah. right? Yeah. He's not crying. He's not whatever. I mean, people yeah. used to say, I'll show you have a baby in that house. You yeah, don't make yeah, no yeah. noise, you know? But I would find I couldn't sleep at night because like the slightest sound he made, I would be jumping, like, up. Just jumping up thinking, you know, uh, can't really sleep because I don't want going to deep sleep and then have to wake up to, to try to feed and stuff like that. So... I breastfed him. I really tried. Mm -hmm. I breastfed him. This is your second boy. Yeah, my yeah. second. Mm -hmm. I breastfed him till about five months. Okay. Uh, give or take. Mm -hmm. um, but in b before the five months was up, actually, um, before then, I had to supplement. And okay. that's why I see both sides of the coin, right? Yeah. I understand both sides because it got to a stage where I, my husband had taken some time off work to just mm -hmm. be at home and help me with the baby. And as the time for him to go back into work mm -hmm. got, got closer, closer, I got more anxious. Yeah. I would just panic about the slightest thing, like, oh, there won't be water there, you know, mm -hmm. like the water to make whatever yeah. it is I need to make, you mm -hmm. know, or to sterilize. I just get panicked about things that really weren't worth panicking about, mm -hmm. right? And um, I just, one night, that was just it. I was just crying all night. I was like, I can't do this. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, I can't do this. I can't do this. And we decided, okay. And the thing is, I had seen the pediatrician like about two weeks prior. And she was happy. I, I was okay yeah, then, you know, yeah. and she was happy. She was happy with the progress and all that. And just out of the blue, it just got too much for me. But you know, you know, the thing is, Nicole, is, is that I don't think that people recognize that postpartum is one of the toughest times for mother and also the impact of mental health issues at that time. Absolutely. So as I told you, I wasn't even factoring in how this how this previous negative experience with, did the with this one. one. Yeah. And so we the next morning my husband took me to the doctor and um to the pediatrician and um had a conversation with her and she was like, Yeah, I think you have postpartum. Um, right. Uh 
I, and mm. she said, but it wasn't to a stage where mm -hmm. I wanted to hurt myself yes, or the baby. Yeah, yeah. It yeah, was this so spectrum. it was well, exactly. Yeah. So I was at the end, yeah. and, and, you know, very yeah. beginning, but just feeling overwhelmed, unable to mm -hmm. function. I was like, I can't do it. I, I know he's a really easy baby, but I cannot yeah. take care of him. Yeah. I'm not up to it. I just yeah. can't get it done. Mm -hmm. And so she, she had actually, she was suggesting, she was thinking she may need to admit me in the hospital and just mm -hmm. have me, you know, mm -hmm. monitored for a bit. And, and mm -hmm. she said, you know what, let me, before we go there, mm -hmm. let me just send you to chat, talk with somebody, mm -hmm. talk with the psychologist and mm -hmm. a counselor and right. just see if, if you really, really have, have a problem. A, yeah, or, or if is this something that, yeah. And that was magic, right? Really? That was, that was the, oh, that, the, the opening that oh, I needed. Oh my gosh, that's I fantastic. Went, I went to this, um, went to this doctor and she was amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, she understood and she said to me, look, if I have to put you on meds, mm -hmm. you won't be able to breastfeed. Mm -hmm. If I have to give you, put you on antidepressants, you won't be able to breastfeed. Mm -hmm. So I want you to stop worrying about mm -hmm. breastfeeding or not breastfeeding yeah. or my good mother, bad mother. Yeah. Let's just focus on getting you back on an even keel. Yeah. I think you're tired. Mm -hmm. She said, I, I don't think there's anything too much wrong with you. I think that's a, besides the fact that you are, you are at your wit's end. Like every mother So she's like, you know what? Mm -hmm. I want you to supplement. Mm -hmm. You can still continue to breastfeed, but supplement him so that he is not taking up that much of your energy now so mm -hmm. that you can just focus on feeling better. That was the best sleep I have had in my life. <laughs> In my <laughs> life, I lie not. Because my husband was on duty then. He still mm. hadn't gone. It mm. wasn't quite time for him to go back to work yet. Mm. So he was able, she was like, let the hubby take mm. care of the baby. You, you, when you go home, just go to bed and rest. Mm -hmm. I have never slept. Like how, because you, it was you such a really, reassurance. I, I let yeah. go of everything. I yeah. didn't have to be responsible. Because there's also that sense, over and above the breastfeeding per se, mm -hmm. there's that sense of this little person is like 100% dependent on me. Yeah. And that, that can be a really overwhelming but feeling do you know, sometimes. But do you know that it, there's actually there, that transition from not being a parent? I mean, I went through it too. I have two children as well, two girls. Not being a parent. And then me and a parent forget feeding them. Exactly. Forget feeding them. The you responsibility. Have the responsibility. Absolutely. You got to keep them warm. Yeah. You got to change nappies. You got to bathe them without drowning them. You know? <laughs> exactly. You know I mean? exactly. You know, you know, you know, these are key things that you have to do when you have a baby apart from feeding them. Yeah. So it's, it's overwhelming. Yeah. And if you don't have, if you don't have that support, it is. Yeah. yeah. So then I, I, I switched then. So he wasn't exclusively he was exclusively breastfed for maybe breastfed for about maybe three months right and then at that point i started supplementing right. and of course with breastfeeding less it means mm -hmm. your milk is less yes so even though i was trying my best when i traveled i traveled with the pump of i tried to did. pump milk <laughs> and all of that i think by about month five mm -hmm. i just gave you know it just wasn't it so, wasn't uh, worth it so to speak because i was getting so little milk by that point I mean, everybody in Barbados has heard breast is best. The whole world has heard breast is best. So you're doing not necessarily thinking about the nutrition of it. You're, you've been told that it's good for bonding, good for health, and all the rest of it. But you haven't gone, you know, dive deep to figure out exactly what that is about. So you're just doing it because you're supposed to. Mm -hmm. But at what point, because I, you know, we are on, on the Barbados Childhood Obesity Prevention Coalition together. And sometimes I see you messaging stuff about what your sons ate. And what, you know, what, what foods you're going to eat. They're going to kill me. Yes. <laughs> what foods to eat and, you know, what you, you know, um, Trying you, to do. alternatives and so on. So at what point did that happen? Where, when did you start work thinking that your child's nutrition was so important that what you, you were going to pay attention to what they put inside their, inside their stomach? So not for a while in the sense that I, like many mothers out there, I think, incorrectly thought I was making good nutritional choices. So I mm. always was trying to strive. So breath is best, right? Right, right. right. And then even following on from there, I mean, mm. you have the general sense, you know, you know, don't fry, don't, mm. you know, those mm. sorts of things. And so even as I introduced the kids then to solid foods and stuff like that, you're trying to, you know, mm -hmm. cook in a way that is, is, is healthy. Um, but absolutely with my 
maybe even yeah with my second child too because so a lot of my awareness of you know the food space and the challenges that we have in the food space came out of my work with healthy caribbean coalition right but which didn't that day yeah. back to about 2015 2016 right my second son was born in 2013 right okay yeah. and so at that time i was very much one of those parents that was giving them you know the baby food in the bottle right the um the, the the snacks and stuff, but checking, you know, and mm -hmm. seeing whole grain and, and seeing that that good for you sense. and, you know, <laughs> seeing all the, all, all, all the um, you know, heart healthy. Right. So I would be very deliberate yeah. about what I was doing, yeah. thinking that this is a good choice. So if it is that I wasn't cooking for them or mm -hmm. something like that, I'm making a choice that is appropriate. These and good. things you This is organic. Right. This is thing. This is good for baby. And, mm -hmm. the, and it's only then, you know, like your eyes get open that you're yeah. like oh my gosh you yeah. know half of those things the first ingredient is sugar and you know or yeah. second or third yeah. you know and 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 you're like wow if i mean now i know better i'll do better not having any more kids so they're not going <laughs> to benefit so from that knowledge yeah but um certainly then what i've been able to do then is to make better choices mm -hmm. unfortunately you know as i said what's done is done mm -hmm. the choices that were mm -hmm. made when they were babies were made but at least now when the space as i as mm -hmm. the kids continue to go to try to make better more informed choices because uh, and that's the thing it it you know, you do better when you know exactly better, right? you do what you can when you can and when you know better exactly. you do better exactly so they they will absolutely benefit when they're 30 and 40 years old they're not going to be the ones absolutely. with all the hypertension and diabetes exactly. And, exactly that's the hope and prayer so let's move over now to a bit more of your role as a professional okay um there's a the a question i want to ask is so you're a, a you you deal in international law yes. that's your expertise yes. and you work with or you you you've worked with world trade organization well right when i was so i spent um six years with our mission in geneva so when right. i was in the foreign service i would have been attached to our our mission in geneva right and you also specialize in global health law as well well so that, yeah, since i got back home i've got right. into the global health law yes. right so trade health Human law, rights. Human rights. I mean, there's a whole potpourri of stuff you got going on, Nicole. Why did you choose to advocate for healthy eating, particularly among Barbadian children? What was okay. your reason? So my, my, my journey in this advocacy space began with my family history. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I have a strong family history, both on my, well, particularly on my mom's side of the family, but mm -hmm. including on my dad's side. Of diabetes, right? With yeah, you know, it's mm -hmm. so many people yes. in Barbados, yep. right? Yeah, and and so from the time my mom was diagnosed with um, diabetes, which was back in two, 1997, something like that, I mm -hmm. already was you know aware and sensitive to those issues and trying to do things like not put sugar in your tea and right. you know those sorts of things. And so I had come back from Geneva and I, I don't remember how I had come across it but somehow I came across um, something talking about Healthy Caribbean Coalition. Right. This CSO that deals with NCD prevention and control. And I'm fresh back from Geneva with all this knowledge about trade but also too there was a lot there was some litigation taking space place in that space relating to you know some of the some of the actions that governments were trying to take to deal mm -hmm. with um, tobacco etc yeah and and that had trade implications right and so I thought this is a perfect marriage mm -hmm. my my wish to sort of work in a field in an area which I know um, you know I am personally um, mm -hmm. attached to because of my family history uh, but then also to being able to utilize my my expertise in right. terms of public international law generally, but international trade in particular. And then to also marry with that, my mom very mm -hmm. much raised us as people that have to give public service and right. give back. And right. you know, you don't just develop yourself, you also make sure that your society around you um, benefits. And so those three things aligned, mm -hmm. I reached out to ACC and as we say, the rest this is history, history, right? Yep. So yeah. since then I've been their policy advisor and that really, that was a pivotal point for me because that really got me 
I am more health, global health law lawyer these days than right. an international trade lawyer. That's interesting. Um, I have more health and human rights than trade, and, and, and the beginning was right there. But when I, that, that overture to ACC, and their, you know, very warm and welcoming, you yes, know, response, yeah. and, um, you know, figuring out a space for me within the organization as their policy advisor, I just, you know, got exposed to more and more knowledge and mm -hmm. began to understand the complexity of this space, right. and therefore um, able to better utilize that knowledge now, not just professionally, but also professionally, much to my son's dismay. <laughs> They're like, oh, I remember the good old days. I remember the days. I, I remember the days when we used to get soda, and, you yeah. know, we could get fast food, and we could get <laughs> burgers. And, uh, yeah. yeah, right, okay. And then obviously, and and the focus on children, I, I know, has to be because we are two boys as well. Absolutely. And, and, and wanting them to grow up in a better, I mean, not just, the foods that they eat, but a general environment, that the environment is cleaner for them to make better choices. They're not going to be children forever. They're going to grow up and you want their spaces to be, you know, so the school, you know, with the school nutrition policy and then just having better spaces for them to, to grow up in. Yeah, absolutely. I yeah. want to, you know, the idea is to create a culture within my home. I mean, I know they're not with me forever, mm -hmm. but the idea is, as, you know, they keep on with me, but you can't control us. When I'm like, yeah, no, I can't control you once you leave me, yeah. but hopefully you would be sufficiently sensitized in a way that I wasn't. But Nicole, you know you're going to be sitting on their <laughs> shoulder when they're adults and, oh, oh gosh, what would mommy do? Or oh, what would mommy exactly. say? Well, exactly. So that's why I said, I don't worry, I put in the ground work now, exactly. and then I don't need to be around because you're going to be hearing, hearing me as you walk, as hearing you're going to pick up that thing that you know you shouldn't eat. Exactly. Um, and then on, on any level, whether it's individual, institutional, community or policy, what do you think are the reasons why we have or, or what are the existing issues that we have in Barbados in terms of getting our children to eat healthy? So I think there are a number of challenges. Um, first is cultural, mm -hmm. right? We know we live in, you know, I mean, we've come up in communities where um, if, if we think, I mean, won't name any, That's but if, if any mm. of our, you know, dishes that we are, are, are iconic dishes, or, let us yes, say, the things dishes. that are seen as this, mm. you can't be in Barbados unless you had X, yep. right? Mm -hmm. High in salt, high, high in fat, high in sugar. sugar. Right, mm -hmm. so it's cultural, and 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 that's a big challenge, and that's mm -hmm. something that will take time. You know, over time you will. Well, of course, we're exploring ways to create those dishes in slightly healthier yeah, ways, etc. Mm -hmm. But also too in helping people understand better about the nutritional content. That maybe okay, you have X, whatever, but you don't have it every single day or mm -hmm. every week because you're conscious now, a better, um, uh, more aware of of the nutritional issues related to it. Mm -hmm. So that is the cultured one. I think accessibility is another. Mm. I mean, that's a huge, thing. and I don't think it's 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 for kids alone. I mean, I think just generally for anyone trying to make better health choices. I I was you know somewhere on the south coast um or recent a few weeks ago, and you know I was I was so committed to making a good choice. I I, I had left <laughs> home. I, I wasn't gonna get back home in time for lunch. I hadn't cut the you know. I'm on the road, I'm doing something, and I'm like, I'm going to go by this place with this full court or whatever and, you know, have something to eat. And I, I'm working out and I'm going to have the salad, right? I'm going to have this thing that's not so healthy because, mm -hmm. but I'm going to make sure. And I go there and there's no salad, mm. right? Yeah. And so, and, and that happens all the time. Sometimes, you know, you're really trying hard to make a good choice but the choices available to you are so limited mm. in terms of being able to make a healthier choice. And this is now irrespective. So speaking from, I guess, what we would say a position of privilege, mm -hmm. this is irrespective of cost. Yeah. I was happy to pay whatever I needed to pay for the salad mm -hmm. to be able to, to at least solve my conscience that I was eating halfway but it just healthy, wasn't there. but it just wasn't there, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think accessibility is huge. And it's the same thing in our schools, right? Mm -hmm. This is a conversation I was having with someone earlier. Yes, um, it's important to educate our kids about, you know, public education is critical, mm -hmm. right? We have to educate them, help them understand how to make better choices. But if all I have available to me at school are unhealthy options, then we're doing the best of the worst case scenario, right? Yeah. So with the least unhealthy, 
<laughs> and, and that's not a conversation. That's yeah, not yeah. an equation yeah, we want our yeah. kids having to think. We want yeah. them to be able to say, I have these have the options. Let me, you know, let me opt for that. Right. So, so, but isn't there, I know, okay, so there's unhealthy foods in the school, right? Say that that's what the scenario that we have. Where is the onus then? Isn't the onus on the parents to say, okay, there's not, there's not very healthy stuff in the school, but I am going to provide you with healthy home cooked meals. So, I mean, what do you say in yeah. that instance? So, absolutely as a parent, so I can mm. speak for myself, you know, personally mm. being a mother, absolutely I accept that parents have an important responsibility mm -hmm. in terms of one, educating their kids about making mm -hmm. better choices, but also mm -hmm. to providing better choices mm -hmm. for their kids to take. But I think it is unrealistic and unreasonable mm -hmm. to expect a child. So my child walks in with his, um, <laughs> with his carrots and his thing, right? And somebody <laughs> there munching a chocolate donut. And he's Oreo supposed cookies. to feel good, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I will give you a little anecdote. My son is going to kill me. <laughs> so he, he told mm. me, you know, they used to switch lunch at, you know, you would trade snacks. Okay. So uh -huh. when he was at primary school, you know, at, at break time, you would trade snacks. He said, no, boy, I ever wanted to trade with me. Because oh I was God. always the person who only had fruit. Oh, no. <laughs> right? and, and so my poor child is scarred, right? I, I'm totally not bothered, of course. But... He, to this day, he complains to me about, yeah, mommy, don't do to, you know, the younger one what you did to me. Where, oh. You know, nobody wanted to trade with me because I never had anything fun in my lunchbox, oh, right? No. And and equally, mm. there was some day and there was some, you know, they having, you know, this something the other that mm. they're selling. I'm telling him, the money I gave you is not to buy that stuff. And he's like... Oh my goodness, mommy. I mean, like, give me a break. Okay. I'm always the one. I'm always the one in the class who can't do these things. I need to ask my, because I am a similar mother, I need to ask my daughter. She's never said anything to me, but perhaps I need to ask her. <laughs> no, I, I, I discovered start. this after he left primary school. Ah, I didn't even know at the time. Okay. And, and so I think, you know, mm. I don't want my child to have to deal with that stress. Yeah. I don't think it. You know, children are entitled to go to school and school be a safe space. Mm. Safe physically and, you know, in terms of away from violence and stuff like that, but also too in terms of not having the, life is difficult enough. They have enough peer pressure and other pressures. Why should they, and, and let's be honest, this stuff tastes good. It's mm, not that it, it doesn't it, taste it, good. It does taste right? good. Right? Yeah. And so, you know, can I really expect my six-year-old child to waltz into class school and go, oh, no, I'm not going to buy. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, not going to have Oreo cookies. Yeah. I'm going to have an apple. Yeah. yeah. And, and on top of that, and, and this relates to now another challenge, just sort of doubling mm -hmm. back to your, early, your original question. One of the challenges you have, so I try, I really try to cook for mm -hmm. my kids because you know what they're eating when you cook it, right? Mm -hmm. So, but... There have been so many occasions when for one reason or another, I'm, I've been too busy at work, I didn't get to the supermarket, so there's nothing there to cook. Yeah. Um, you know, I have a meeting or something, everybody is having to watch out at the same time, I don't have time, didn't have time to cook, came in late the night, whatever it is. And I need mm -hmm. to tell them about Go by canteen, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And that's why it's important too. It's not that every single time I'm necessarily, I try to limit how much canteen they have to buy. Yeah. But I would like to have some level of comfort as a parent that, when they that go, the messaging that yeah. goes is still consistent with the messaging that we have yeah. in our household. Yeah. And so I think it's not an either or. Mm -hmm. It's not, or it's the school's responsibility or the government's responsibility, yeah. not mine. It's both. I have a role, but the government is such a critical player mm. in terms of creating that enabling environment that supports the types of choices that I want to make as a, a parent trying to get my kids to eat healthier. Yeah. And at the end of the day, when you think about it, our kids are away from us yeah, from a, a 8 o'clock to 3, amount of time. 5 days a week. Yeah. So absolutely a huge responsibility has to be on the school yeah. to make sure that that environment is appropriate one for kids. But then, and then also, um, you talked about culture, you talked about accessibility, the environments in school and so on, but also how much of it is related to the, to the finances 
the financial constraints that some parents have in terms of wanting to be able to make those better choices, but they think that the food, the healthy food, is far more expensive than the unhealthy food. So instead of buying the apple, I'm just calling it, instead of buying the apple, they buy the tea time biscuits or whatever it is because they think so. Do you agree that unhealthy foods are far less expensive than the healthy foods? So I think as with most things in life, it's not black and white, mm -hmm. right? So it's not a, that well, absolutely all unhealthy foods are, are, are mm -hmm. cheap and, and all on unhe uh, all healthy foods are, are really, really expensive. I think the, 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 the spaces are complex. One, I think there are real challenges. There are mm -hmm. some, you, we know there are challenges with the cost of fruits and vegetables, mm -hmm. even local fruits and vegetables, you know, because obviously if you're buying the imported stuff, it's going to yeah. be more, but even local fruits and vegetables. And I know many people say, oh, well, just go straight to the market. And then mm -hmm. I'm telling you, I shop in the supermarket. Mm -hmm. I do not have time. Mm -hmm. I, I barely have time to get to the supermarket, to buy the groceries in the supermarket. Yeah. I literally don't have time to be going around to markets and, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, buying this from here and buying this from there. Um, and so I think, you know, we have to appreciate that it's a complex space. It's not an either or. And to provide the support that is needed to help people from where they're at, to help everybody's not in exactly the same circumstance. Mm -hmm. So I'm somebody who's happy. If I have good choices in the supermarket, I'm able to maybe, you know, close your eyes and pick it up mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and hope your purse don't, yeah, quite yeah. too much when you get to the <laughs> checkout, right? Um, somebody else maybe is not in that position. They're, mm -hmm. they're a little bit more constrained in terms of some of those choices that they can make. Um, I'm not I'm mm -hmm. not flush by any stretch mm -hmm. of the imagination, mm -hmm. but you, of course, sometimes make sacrifices. You don't do something else. Yeah. But, while some people just don't, sometimes don't have the luxury of making those, those swaps, choices, right? Yeah. Um, and so I think there is still, still room for us to continue to examine. Mm -hmm. um, sort of methodologies, measures that can be put in place to help people manage that space better. I know Minister Cummins was speaking in the Senate a few weeks ago, months ago, about you know the government having a look at what the levels of taxation on healthy mm -hmm. foods versus unhealthy, unhealthy foods. foods. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a legitimate conversation. I don't think we can just shut it out and say, oh, stuff is cheap. Mm -hmm. And I think as well, and it's something that came up in the HSFB consultation that we had, I think also too sometimes in terms of person's sense of the, the, the challenges of, of cooking healthier or doing a healthier option is sometimes they don't know. They don't mm. know how to prepare it better. That's true. Right? So that's mm -hmm. sometimes a barrier. And yeah. so it is easier than just to get the fast food thing or the, the quick pre-prepared um, whatever. So we also have to invest some some effort. And I know HSFB and others are working in this space to help educate people about different ways to prepare mm -hmm. foods and ways that alternatives will be, uh, that they can use uh, that are yeah. tasty yeah. and stuff like that. And then it also and it also has to be convenient because uh, you know some mm -hmm. We live in a very fast-paced world, so mm -hmm. we, we do need so we need to revisit that, and um, and equally then even things like in terms of the basket of goods that we have that is VAT-free. Mm -hmm. You know, there's space for government to reflect on how much of that basket, mm -hmm. you know, to ensure to tick the box that that basket is actually a good, strong, nutritionally based um, basket yeah. so that we, we make sure that those who are, are more vulnerable and with less income available to them yeah. are still able to, 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 get, nutritious to, to food. get nutritious food. So we're going a little bit more to trade now mm -hmm. as your role as a trade expert. Um, the, the landscape, the trade landscape that we currently have, how does that impact the availability and affordability of, of nutritious food options? So, I mean, trade has basically been one of those factors that really influence or help drive our, so we've gone through a nutritional transition, right? Between yeah. like when my parents were young yeah. and, and mm -hmm. now, so mm -hmm. we've had this transition moving from more locally grown, mm -hmm. you know, whole to foods, foods to, to more ultra processed, energy, energy dense, nutrient uh, um, mm -hmm. ultra processed products. I'm, I'm reliably informed we shouldn't call it food because it's not really food, <laughs> it's ultra processed products, right? Fine. Fine. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, and so we've seen, trade has definitely influenced that. But equally, in the same way that we've had a lot of these nutrient dense, high mm -hmm. energy, high fat, whatever foods coming in, we've also had trade opening mm -hmm. the opportunities for healthier options coming in as well. That's true. And so, so the idea is that 
that trade is neither a good or a bad, as, mm -hmm. as the case may be. It's how you utilize it and what are the tools that you put in place to, to, to contain it mm -hmm. consistent with the, with the objectives that you have in mind. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, if we think of something like front of part one and labels mm -hmm. that HSFB, the Childhood mm -hmm. Obesity Prevention Coalition, and others, ACC, others have been advocating for for a long time. And in fairness to the Barbados government, they have consistently yeah, supported. supported from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, you can see how something like that, even as you have trade mm -hmm. and whatever is coming in, you then something like front of part one and labels empowers me as a consumer that yes, it's there, but it doesn't mean I buy it because, mm -hmm. you know, going back to my mm -hmm baby experience, right? Mm -hmm. I am now not going to be picking up that bottled baby food thinking it's a good choice because yeah. it's going to have slapped on it. High sugar, high, high salt, sugar, high, high salt, salt whatever. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, 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 that's mm -hmm. not not for my baby. I'm mm -hmm. not. And equally for myself in terms of, I my grown kids now in terms of um, the products that we have. And just a real quick question about the front of package warning labeling. Do you think that's why there is a lot more pushback? Because it seems so simple. I mean, why are you smiling? But it, it seems so simple. That octagonal black mark that says high fat, high sugar, high salt. It's a no brainer, it's right? It's a no brainer. You literally, no. And so that, I, is, I'm assuming, is the reason why there is so, so much pushback. Yeah, it's so funny. We did some um, advocacy around mm -hmm. the, the front of part one and labels because we've been working at this now for, for four, four plus years. Yeah. Um, and we had done some regional advocacy. ACC had done some regional advocacy with UNICEF and PAHO and, and these people. And we had done a session in, in Belize and, and, and they asked exactly the question. When we finished describing, you know, what <laughs> we were trying, they were like, there's a problem with this? There's, there's somebody that objects to this? Yeah. And, and the challenge is this, mm -hmm. that a lot of the products that we have in our market, a lot of the products that our manufacturers maybe are producing, maybe would have that mm -hmm. sticker on, on it. it. Yeah. And, and, you know, have that high-end warning mm -hmm. label. Mm -hmm. And so... And also to be very comfortable sometimes in the space where we are and not really looking to change in terms of reformulation, et cetera, because yeah. that can it's be gonna challenging. Cost, that's going to be the, cost, the, potentially the, costly, the, et Challenging. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, absolutely. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of the pushback has to do, um, you know, when you say sometimes when people make a noise, you know you're on the right track, yes, right? Yeah, it's yeah, that sort of a thing. Right. It's absolutely because this has been tried and Tested. I mean, they've even done a study um, mm. in, in Jamaica, a randomized control study in Jamaica, mm. and, and consistently, wherever they do it, however they do it, this, this black octagonal warning label comes, comes out on top right. in terms of a system that allows for accurate, mm -hmm. quick, mm -hmm. easy yeah. That's um, key. identification, key. those three things, right? Yeah. Accurate, um, mm. quick, and easy. Yeah. Um, identification. I can't tell you the amount of time I've been in the supermarket and looking Confused. at these things. Oh my like, goodness. And even with mean? the parameters that we now have in the school mm -hmm. nutrition um, policy yeah. um, in terms of snacks and stuff, which I was so happy for. Yeah. I I'm still, I'm still struggling a bit because, yeah. you know, Every product doesn't express what's in it in the, quite the, the same, same way. way. The yeah. baseline they're using is maybe not the baseline that, you know, mm -hmm. the, 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 the measurement that is being used on the package. I'm like, I still don't know if this is good or not. And, and also, if you're not savvy with these, these um, nutritional, uh, the, the, the information, when it says 120 calories, you think, oh, that's not so much. But then you have to know how many servings. Exactly. Is that, so you, if you're not savvy, yeah, and most so people are really not. 120 per serving, per and there are like five servings, servings in the pack. And you right? the whole pack, like, oh, 500 and something <laughs> calories. You know, so exactly. It, so it's, it, it can be very confusing, which is why the octo octo octagonal know, warning labeling. It, would be, would, it, 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 that would be a yeah. life changer. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I would tend to, t tend to agree. So, Nicole, we know that in countries um, around the world, including closer to home, Mexico, Chile, for example, that there are strategies and initiatives that can help us promote healthy eating. Um, can you give us some ideas about what these strategies and initiatives are? Sure. Uh, and so, if we take Chile, Chile is an excellent example. So, Chile would have been the one that launched this whole front of part one mm -hmm. and labels the black octagonals in particular. Are you talking about internationally? They're the ones that launched? Yes. It? They, they were okay. the ones that, they were the first to, to have the, the black octagonal warning labels. Right. And, and this, what's important to stress is that Chile hasn't 
just relied on one policy or strategy. Mm. What they've done is to marry this, so they have an overarching goal of, you know, tackling the very high levels of NCDs and, and, and childhood obesity in particular and helping children live healthier lives. And so what they've done is to address it as a comprehensive in a comprehensive way, because of course it's a multifactorial mm -hmm. complex problem, right? Yeah. And so we have front of part warning labels. Mm -hmm. So then the front of part warning labels collect to the school environment where they have a policy regulating what can and cannot be sold and marketed in the school environment, right. which of course anything with those labels on it, yes. not yeah, going yeah, to be yeah. in your schools. Yeah. But then also to they've um, address the, the wider environment within the society. So when you go into a supermarket in Chile, you're not going to see all of those cartoon characters. You're not going to mm. see Elsa, Anna, and <laughs> Paw Patrol and all of these things yeah. on these products that are high in salt, fat, and sugar mm -hmm. right and so which are, are very deliberately placed there to target kids mm -hmm. for kids to then put the pressure on 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 parents and that that is another one of the going back to our very earlier d discussion of, of the challenges um, that we have navigating this space the predatory and misleading marketing that is uh, so prevalent in, in in the society and so Chile has tackled that as well mm -hmm. in terms of making sure that within the supermarket you know the product is still there. You can buy it if you like, mm. but you're not going to be able to be be working psychologically on people through imagery, et cetera, colors and all of those things to, 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 to drive them towards an unhealthy product. Is it, is it working? Are all these Yes, things? absolutely. So okay. the, 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 the studies that they've done thus far, so it's been maybe, it's not been many, many years, maybe three, four mm -hmm. years now. Um, COVID has everything, it's a blur, yep. right? Yeah, um, But it's been a few years, mm -hmm. but certainly they've had, I, I, I'm fairly certain I've come across some evidence, but it's obviously monitoring and evaluation is an ongoing thing, so you mm -hmm. can't be very definitive at this stage, it's early stages of implementation, but they've seen good results, certainly. And then also what they also do is they regulate the broadcasting space. Right. So during those times when kids are stuck Looking at the screen, yeah. certain ads, etc., can't can't be shown. Mm -hmm. And then another example that I can think of, which sort of ties in with the whole marketing, predatory marketing, misleading marketing, as the case may be, is um, which has not been, you know, not such great news. So in the UK, in 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 in. in in the UK, they were to bring in a policy sort of with the supermarkets not doing these, you know, buy two chocolates, get one mm -hmm. free, you know, mm -hmm. the three for the one, because studies show that actually it is the poor. So there's this mis misconception that, oh, you know, we can't tax these things because mm -hmm. that's all that per persons can afford. Yeah. And one, there's a cost to that as we, we tend to forget because there's a cost to having NCDs. Mm -hmm. There's a cost, I mean, an Absolutely. immediate cost, not just the long-term cost of premature death. There's an immediate cost in terms of your loss of productivity, your feeling ill and, and mm -hmm. those sorts of things, having to go to the doctor or, or go to the polyclinic as the case may be. And we know then that that's a quite long stay, how that impacts on your, your, your work, etc. And so there's a cost there. But also what it shows is that persons then tend, you know, you always think, who wants to pass up a deal, right? <laughs> we always it's trying to save. Aspect. We always trying to save oh, money. My mother's, gonna right. kill me. Like, my mother's like that. Oh my gosh, can't pass up one uh, deal. Uh, how, how how can I pass this up? I mean, yeah, I'm getting yeah. three for the cost exactly. of two. Exactly. Uh, uh, and and the idea is that the studies show that it is those groups that are most vulnerable that have right. the least disposable income right. that really tend to then spend, that they overspend. Because then. they're following those promotions. So, so they're right. following these promotions, they tend to buy these things, and then of course they have less yeah. Yeah. income for the things that they really need to spend on. Mm. So um, England has taken a, you know, they've delayed once again um, right. that implementation. Okay. Um, but fortunately, Wales has moved ahead. And in fact, what we've seen, which has been amazing, is the supermarkets mm -hmm. have stepped up to the plate and, and said, look, the government we're, isn't going to move on this, but we're, we're committed to children's health. Wow. So we are going to, we, we are. So Sa with those. Sainsbury's and a few of the others have, yeah. have indicated that no, even though the, the measure hasn't come into force as yet, mm -hmm. they, they will still, they will be no longer discontinuing the, those types of promotions. And so I say all of this to say, and, and we have other examples. Mexico has had a very positive experience mm -hmm. with their SSB taxation, yeah. where we have seen how the, the um, 
the most vulnerable, the ones who have benefited the most from that, that tax has been the poor and the vulnerable because those are the ones that were drinking soda, mm -hmm. like if it was water. Yeah. And now, in fact, they have water yeah. and they're drinking the water instead <laughs> and they're much healthier. Right. And, and um, as well, uh, Uruguay also has um, regulation of the school environment. So a lot is happening in Latin America that we can learn from. But... Uh, it's nothing new, really. We're, mm -hmm. we're grappling with them, and credit to us, we, we have them on our agenda, the front of part one and labels, the SSB, the, the, yeah. the SSB tax, yeah. the, the um, school nutrition policies, but that we really do need to continue making progress in this space and perhaps widen the ambit so we haven't tackled was, the marketing yet yeah. directly, you know, yeah. more broadly, because that, that's a really sensitive and difficult one. But we've seen how in Chile that can, how that can be done. So when I so you just talked about widening, I want to know about widening beyond the space that you're in now with the school nutrition policy, SSBs, etc. Why do you think that there's not as many strategies and initiatives that are being that they're there, um, but not being followed through with? For example, in my space, the early childhood nutrition space, the breastfeeding and complementary feeding space. Um, what what do you think is the obstacle I, there? I think that, you know, governments always have competing priorities. Uh, of course. Um, and in our instance, in the Caribbean, limited resources. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes political choices are made. Mm -hmm. um, I think as well, and there's something we were discussing earlier, it also speaks to the importance of civil society engagement and, and, and work at the grassroots level. So we know every five years they come in for that, that vote, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and now they're trying, you know, mm -hmm. the government is trying to engage people a little bit more with the parish speaks, etc. Mm -hmm. So it's really important for, for you and I and other people, mm -hmm. whether you have kids or don't have kids. I mean, all of us, pretty much everybody in Barbados know somebody mm -hmm. or is related to somebody who has an NCD. Pretty much. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And and so this is a national issue without a doubt. And so it's something that we need to be speaking to, speaking to forcefully, letting our politicians know this is important to us. Yeah. I mean, this is important. We want to have more emphasis placed on providing support to breastfeeding mothers, to creating and enabling environments with them and not necessarily where they have to 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 you know build a whole new facility because mm -hmm. we know competing priorities yeah. limited resources mm -hmm. but if at least we can get messaging going out where mm -hmm. people begin to understand better about this issue understand why it's important to provide support we can maybe partner with our private sector to help them introduce within their workplace etc then we can still be moving forward right so i think that is really down to political will and, mm. and, and how sexy the topic is at that's, the time, the word, yeah. politically. Yeah. And, and, and to make it sexier mm -hmm. really requires that people on the ground say to politicians, this is important to us. This makes a difference in our lives and in our children's lives. And we really want you to action it. And I think that's part of the reason why we have not, I think it is part of the reason why we have started this podcast, because we wanted to be able to give mothers and families a voice to be able to say in a forum where people are going to listen yeah what 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 we have here is not enough it's not adequate we want more um, and then giving them the empowering them then to go out from the podcast or from wherever they meet us and say you know what i am done with this i'm going to go to my constituency office tomorrow and i'm going to say you know and also to sharing the experiences right yeah. of others globally etc in terms of you know everything doesn't require you know mm. hundreds of millions of dollars. dollars yeah um we just need you know thoughtful intentional targeted um steps being taken to begin and 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 it's not necessarily something that will happen overnight mm -hmm. but we want to see continuous and consistent progress towards this goal of normalizing this space mm -hmm. in terms of breastfeeding because even you know as i was thinking just now even as we say breast is best and everybody says that i i can recall so many conversations on 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 social media etc 
within the region, you know, to do with mothers breastfeeding in public, mm -hmm. for example, yeah. the stigma that is associated with that. Yeah. And so even as we as Caribbean people understand that breast is best, we somehow feel that breast is best means that I must Behind go in, closed door. Like, like, hide yeah. up in some place. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm not saying, you know, let it all hang out. No, but you're able to discreet. There should be no, re you know, I can breastfeed in a restaurant. I can breast. But I can Nicole, do it in a way that's respectful and because I'm not interested in exposing myself to the world either. I remember I used to walk with my little black blanket you just throw your little you know your you have to be over you, yeah, you you know the baby is here on your breast and so somebody can they can clearly but see it wasn't always this way i remember before i left to go overseas to study that i remember seeing boobs everywhere i i remember seeing this either it was in the last podcast i'm sure i've said it a million times i remember seeing boobs oh, all okay. over the place this is about 20 years ago i'm kind of dating myself but you know, Don't worry, we both did it. Don't <laughs> worry about it. <laughs> so, so I remember seeing them everywhere, and then I came back home, and all of a sudden we were all covered up. Um, and I know I, it has a lot to do, I think, with messaging and being exposed to, you know, more. Well, we are Western, Westernized culture, but getting the exposure to social media, seeing what's on Facebook and Instagram, and actually taking it on as our own, even though we never, you know, we never adhere to that prior to Instagram and Facebook. And I thought it was, a, I was disappointed when I came back home and I saw everybody was covered up. I was disappointed when I went to Trinidad, actually, and I got the worst bombastic sight I have ever gotten in my entire life when I was breastfeeding my child. And I wasn't fully exposed. I had a cape over me. And I swear, they were off in a corner and they were whizzy whizzy and talking like I was doing the worst thing in the world. I, I was so disappointed. But again, it's about, as you said, normalizing the space again, because it's not normalized right now. Formula is normalized. Um, and getting a political will, finding one of those politicians, making them a champion for breastfeeding and, and moving from there. Yeah, political will is... Political Big. will to political champions is critical in all these spaces. Yeah. I mean, so all of our evidence tells us whenever, but well, even in Chile, mm -hmm. right? Chile mm -hmm. happened because of a political champion. There was, so a a there was a particular senator in there, that, you know, so all the lines right. are aligned, um, right. the stars aligned. Um, so political champions are, are huge. Um, when I think about St. Lucia, um, St. Lucia's tobacco control, Antigua and Barbuda tobacco, all the different spaces, uh, mm -hmm. when we see progress, it tends to be because in addition to all the technical expertise and the evidence and all of those things, yeah. there's been somebody who's willing to say, yes, I'm going to take this on as my, my issue for. and run with it and, and, and counter when I need mm -hmm. to counter the arguments and, and, and fight for this for the end. Even in um, Australia, mm -hmm. which is, you know, sort of the model in terms of, of, of plain packaging for tobacco mm -hmm. um, control, um, there has happened, you know, their minister of, their minister of health became their minister, their AG. Right, okay. And, and, and so she had started, I mean, Australia, the government as a whole was committed to dealing with this, but obviously you needed somebody One who was willing to, to withstand yeah. the pushback. Yeah. And so as fate would have it, she was minister of health initially, and then, then she became AG or the other way around as the case may be. But, you know, she became the face of, uh, of it in a sense and was able to continue the fight. Another call to action to some minister out there who thinks, hmm, this, I could make this sexy. I could, I could, champion, you know? this. I could yeah. champion this. So if you think that this is something that you think is important and you're willing to stand with us to promote, support and protect breastfeeding, give the BCNF a call. Yep. No, it, it makes a big difference. Huge difference. And I know that, you know, I, I know that in your head you can take off a whole list of international organizations, probably with partners, who could play a real a real supporting role in, in, in our efforts to improve nutrition and mm. address the issues around, you know, the food related challenges. Yeah, so obviously there are a huge number of players in this space, but mm. certainly the ones that immediately come to mind that have really been at the forefront, certainly of the work that Healthy Caribbean Coalition and of HSFB course. and the, yeah. uh, have been doing in this space is um, PAHO, yeah. right? Good old mm. PAHO, <laughs> PAHO, <laughs> UNICEF. Yeah. So UNICEF has been strongly on board the front of part one and labels as mm. well as the um, school nutrition mm -hmm. policies mm -hmm. as a realization mm -hmm. of the rights enshrined within the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, 
it's FAO as well. Mm -hmm. FAO is a critical partner in this space in terms of providing that information about food and, and nutrition and food mm -hmm. security and all of those things. Um, so I would say those are the the, the immediate the leaders, the ones mm -hmm. that immediately jump out yeah. to me um, when I think about um, agencies who do work. And they have, you know, their work ranges from, you know, the regular technical assistance to the ministries and capacity building to working on evidence. So the study that mm -hmm. I mentioned that was done on front of part warning labels in in Jamaica was done by the Ministry of Health Jamaica mm -hmm. in collaboration with PACO and the University of Technology in Jamaica. Right, okay. So they've been m many different roles, technical roles, helping develop evidence, but also to supporting the advocacy work. Right, okay. So quite a few organizations. Yeah. That, and I know for sure that those same organizations that you, you call, they have within their frameworks, I know that they also tackle, you know, I have to speak to breast, my, my space, breastfeeding, the compassion, you know, they also speak to within their frameworks about breastfeeding and the six months, you know. Of course, of course, know, because it's a continuum, right? Exactly. You don't start thinking about nutrition when the child is all grown up, you, four or five yeah, years exactly. yeah. mm -hmm. you know, you, you want to be thinking about it from, from in utero. Because yes. even when you're pregnant, you're Absolutely. thinking about what you're eating because you know what you eat, it's what babies eat eating, yeah. and, and, and it's going to affect their growth and development. And so um, I remember I, I had gestational diabetes during my pregnancy. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. That, that, forgot that. Yes. Not a reason, so not the reason why I really <laughs> needed to be in this gestational space. Gestational diabetes. I yeah. just, just explain. This is diabetes that's happening in pregnancy. It doesn't mean that you necessarily have diabetes after baby has had a baby has been born, but you have it within pregnancy. It does potentially increase your risk for diabetes later on. Absolutely. Yeah. So I live with that over my head, coupled with the, f oh, the family family yes. history. Yes. But yeah, so, you know, I had to be so conscious of what I was eating because it's like I'm eating for me, but I'm also mm -hmm. eating for the, for my baby. Yeah. And I have this condition, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. that can potentially harm the baby's development. So, so you want, I mean, most mothers, if not all, are thinking about nutrition from the very beginning. Yeah. And so it's a continuum. It's not something where you just start thinking about it at, later in life. Yeah. So you definitely need to, to um, and, and so definitely all of those, all of those agencies, in particular PAHO, of course, being mm -hmm. in the health space, yeah. would have all the recommendations, et cetera, about breastfeeding and baby-friendly hospitals Hospital and, and, and all of those things. We always talk about implementation deficit here in the region. <laughs> That's yeah. like a buzzword, implementation deficit. But do we have the policies to implement? Do we do we have, you think, all of the instruments that we need to, in order to improve and promote health in, in this space? So the short answer is no. I think mm -hmm. we're, but, no, but. Okay, okay. Um, we've started. We've started okay. the journey. We're at the very beginning of the journey, I think. Yeah. Um, we started with children, mm -hmm. justifiably Absolutely. so. Absolutely. I have no difficulty with that. <laughs> That's prioritizing the kids, right? Yeah. We started with the children and therefore with the school environment. But it, it, this is not a conversation that can end, end. there. Yeah. Because even though they spend the majority of their time in schools, they're not exclusively in schools. Mm -hmm. One, and also two, they grow up to be adults like you and I. Exactly. Right? And their mm -hmm. food environment continues to be important in that space. And 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 so in terms of gaps, therefore, so we've started, but we need to be they must you know, there are other gaps. So even you know, you've heard the Prime Minister talk about we want to, we're looking at assault tax and, you know, there are other mechanisms, mm -hmm. me other measures that you can introduce to boost and support what is in place already. Yeah. Um, as I said, I would love to see stuff speaking to marketing. Yeah. Um, that's a big sure. gap yeah. in our in our societal space, both marketing, you know, on radio and TV, but also to really importantly in the supermarket. Yeah. What about the digital marketing space? Oh, that's a... That's Absolutely. A, that, that is that, that that is a whole universe all of its own. And we've yeah. seen and, and what tends to happen is so industry pretty much runs the same playbook. Mm -hmm. So b we're seeing very much big food mm -hmm. is following now the playbook the tobacco, of big tobacco. tobacco. Yeah. And so what we have seen and so what we see happening in tobacco, we pretty much know we can anticipate <laughs> can. that in a few years down the road you'll mm -hmm. be grappling with that in the in the in the um, food space. Mm -hmm. And I dare say we may be already encountering it, so it's happened mm -hmm. even quicker than, than would have normally been the case, which is you've seen the transition as, as tobacco got more and more regulated mm -hmm. um, physically and, mm -hmm. you know, 
on television, radio, or whatever, what you're seeing now is a lot of, of, of digital marketing, you yeah. know, a lot of issues yeah. relating to digital marketing, social influencers, yes. the persons who are associated with these brands, and all of them targeted at kids. And that's exactly what's happening with um, Big Formula. Let's, let's call it Big Formula. That's what's happening with them. I mean, we, we saw, I remember when, so let's say things really ramped up in March with COVID here in Barbados. And within months of that, I started wondering, why am I seeing so much formula on my Instagram and Facebook? I don't look at formula. My kids are big. I don't need formula. But everywhere I looked, there were mm. tins of formula. They were talking about um, baby foods and that kind of thing. And I thought, this is really strange. And then, you know, subsequent to that, you know, you have WHO bringing out their reports on the fact that this was a thing that they were doing. They were literally ramping up their digital marketing. Yeah, um, the digital space is a really, it's huge. It has and a it, huge how impact. Do you and, it's, it? and this is the thing. How do you We are very it? much at the beginning, even globally, of trying to figure out. Because, you know, there's no jurisdictional basis. Exactly. You know, it's, it's, it's complicated. It is. <laughs> but we got to start. We got to start trying yeah. to grapple with it because it will definitely be a, be a bigger and bigger issue. I can, I can see it. Um, I could see that potentially being yeah. a, a huge, yeah. huge no, problem. No, without a doubt. For the BCNF, we are really big on um, the concept of advocacy and public awareness. We understand how absolutely important it is. Um, and But do you agree that, that the advocacy and public awareness is really key to driving changes in policy and regulations in terms of, of healthy eating? In terms of political will and political champions, mm -hmm. it's absolutely important that you and I, you mm -hmm. know, it's us down on the ground. As mm -hmm. I said, the change is going to come from the bottom, not the top. Wait, Nicole, hmm? are you saying that you want to join the Breastfeeding Challenge Digital Foundation? <laughs> you said you and I. So I'm just, I'm just. Uh, I'm wait, wait, <laughs> listen, my breastfeeding days are behind me. We are, we, 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 listen, I'm here supporting you. I'm here supporting you as an ally in your, in your I could, podcast. I could not resist. We, could we, not resist. we already went through all the different things that belong to, right? I think if I join one more organization, my kids are going to lock Disown the door. You. Listen, lock the door and put me out and say, listen, you're no longer, you can literally. no longer claim to be our mother. I'm literally just teasing you. Okay, yeah. sorry. I, the more I, I, I say to persons, as I was saying earlier, um, my advocacy colleagues, I, I, I remain convinced. The more I work in this space, the more I think, at least in the region, mm -hmm. um, change is going to come from the bottom, not the top. Mm -hmm. So it will maybe take a little longer than we Definitely. would like because Definitely. working from the bottom, you don't quite have the same resources impact. And, and impact. Yeah. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, like it or not, the decisions have to be made at from the top. The top. Right, yeah. mm -hmm. the implementation has to be to, mm -hmm. for things to really change and, and happen. That has to happen from the top. Yeah. So recognizing that, I still think um, that that is why it's so critical that more and more persons. And I, I find certainly in in Barbados to me, but I, I'm I'm not aware about the rest of the region. I have a sense that Jamaica is a little maybe a little the culture there is maybe a little bit different. Mm -hmm. But I find we don't have that culture as yet. It's yeah. growing more. Yeah. It's developing more. Yeah. That culture of like, civic engagement mm -hmm. and you know advocacy uh, on sort of just everyday issues. And so I I guess um, in short, yeah. we are a critical part of the process because at the end of the day, politicians will re respond mm -hmm. to the pressures that you put on them yeah. in terms of what is important or not. Yeah, and I, 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 I definitely agree. I know for sure that um, this space was not a space before the, the Breastfeeding and Child Nutrition Foundation actually planted itself in it um, in terms of civil society. Uh, and I know that we have, as small as we are, I know that we have created an impact. I mean, it, as you said, it's grassroots, and we just have to keep pushing forward. I mean, the idea is, at the end of the day, you're not looking, I mean, of course, you, you're, you're contemplating change at a national level, at, mm -hmm. a, at a national scale to really be able to impact and change people's lives. But as we say, you know, in, in other contexts, if you change somebody's life, one person's life, that, yeah. that's yeah, amazing. Huge. That's, that's huge. huge right? And maybe that life that you've changed, they will then influence uh, Exactly. I so, remember. So the fact mm -hmm. that 
you know, that from day to day you can't say, oh, this whole community changed because mm -hmm. of something I did. Yeah. Doesn't mean that you're not, that you there's not value that you've brought to this space. And I remember when uh, there was a year that I went to Tobago and they had their um, World Breastfeeding Week mm -hmm. and they had hundreds of people turning up for breakfast thing for World Breastfeeding Week. And I was astounded <laughs> because in Barbados, <laughs> like that and I thought okay so this is what we're aiming right towards it gave me a sense hope. of hope that hope. you know even though this is where we are now this is something that we can go towards and the minister well the minister of health in Tobago he basically said he was the champion for this right. organization and he basically said I want you to leave from here as disciples for breastfeeding so You've been impacted. Go and impact spread five, the word. Go five, spread the word. Spread it to five other people. Right. And that's the that's the um, tap that I take now. Just spread the information as you go along. Yeah. Um, so, so I guess in a sense we've talked about what can individuals and communities do to to you know impact. Yeah. Just be engaged. Just yeah. be engaged and and be informed. Of course, always with the caveat that you pay attention to where you get your information from. Very careful. But be mm -hmm. engaged and be informed. And, and like I said, I mean, my whole, th this whole journey that I'm on really and truly began with a small little email. I saved it for historic reasons. Really? To the, uh, the executive director of HCC saying, there's this thing going on and can I help you? You know, I have this background. I have a family history of diabetes. Can oh. I assist? And I could not have imagined. Yeah. Well, I could not have imagined the impact because literally, even things like the Law and Health Research Unit, mm -hmm. my inspiration to do that, all of that can be traced back, back to my to a, initial. Yeah. Because uh, it was Sir George Allen, who was mm -hmm. Chancellor of the University at the time. Yeah. Always, you know, he's such a champion on NCD yeah. prevention and control. And so every graduation, mm -hmm. There was not a graduation of anybody that he did not speak about NCD somehow, <laughs> somehow, some form, some Even fashion. Even it became more fashionable. And in 2016, I, I remember to this day, I, I don't go to graduation a lot, but that right. graduation, I was there, and he challenged all the faculties of the, of the KFL campus. Yeah. This is not a medical issue. This is a development issue. Mm -hmm. I want to see all the faculties wow. in the university making a contribution to this discussion. I was like, hmm, I wonder what law could do. Yeah. Right? And having already started my work, you know, working in this space with Healthy Caribbean Coalition, it became a little clear and a little clear yeah, and a little such clear. An innovative idea to actually challenge everyone that you're not in health, but it don't matter if you're not in health. This well, is that's a health. George for you, you wow. know, he's that sort of person. <laughs> right. So, I mean, we've had this really wide ranging, far reaching, yes. <laughs> extensive conversation. But I want you to answer this last question for me. Right, okay. What advice do you have for our policymakers and even our stakeholders involved in shaping and creating and implementing policies related to healthy eating? What advice do you have for them and what are some of the steps that you could advise them to take to create real change in this space? Lots I don't know that I have any, any deep words of wisdom. Wow. Um, what I would say is it's a long, hard battle. Absolutely. You have not to for be the faint of heart. Exactly. Not for the faint of heart. You have to be committed. You have to be passionate. Like I tell you, the Don't Have Research Unit is my mm. passion project. Yeah. Right? Mm. So um, it's something that will take up your time and your energy, but it's so rewarding because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you know, you're making a difference in people's lives, however small, uh, however small a scale initially, as we yeah. were discussing just now. So recognize, be realistic about the fact that this is a long-term commitment, but one that's so important that will really make a difference in, in individuals' lives, but also the country, because we know the cost, economic mm -hmm. and non-economic, associated with our, our unsustainable levels of NCDs and obesity, et cetera. So, so bear that in mind. And empower yourself. Um, empower yourself in terms of giving back. So mm -hmm. as I did, reaching out. So 
thinking about your skill set because all of these problems are multi-sectoral, right? Multi-sectoral mm -hmm. complex problems. So they call for a, a range of skills. Like when we think about the Barbados Obesity Coal um, Prevention Coalition, mm -hmm. I mean, one of the strengths of that coalition is the you diversity so of the membership, from spaces, right? Yeah. So we're doing the school nutrition policy now, and then, you mm -hmm. know, Nicole Griffith and, and, and yeah, the nutritionists yeah. are able to step forward. Yeah. At the time when we're doing front of part one and label the advocacy, yeah. I was stepping forward. You yeah. know, there's always a role for different players in that space, and mm -hmm. we're able to learn from each other and benefit from that cross fertilization. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a, a medical doctor by mm. any stretch of the imagination, <laughs> but you know, I yeah. learned a few things, yes, right? Yeah, yeah, I've yeah, learned yeah. a few things along the way in terms of how to manage certain things or, or some of the issues that arise um, in this space. So empower yourself in terms of giving back, but also too in terms of just learning more about what's happening on the ground, you know, what these issues entail, how we can do better. Because of course we don't just want to copy, copy, copy. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that when we, we implement these, these measures, these initiatives, that they're things that can actually work in our, our context. And also to, and I guess it's related to the first point, which is recognize this is a long term, it's mm -hmm. not for you faint of heart, be realistic. Mm -hmm. Right about what about you're what, going, what your constitution is actually going to achieve. Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. What you're going to be. There's certain. I mean, a lot of decisions have to be made above your pay grade, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. And so you can just. You know, we say sometimes, let go and let God. You know, you just go <laughs> take it as far as you can yeah. get it, and then you'll be like, you know what? If this is to happen, it will happen because you know I've carried it as far as I can take it. Continue to. You know, monitor mm -hmm. and um, keep, but don't forget about this thing. But recognize that there's certain things that alter your hands in terms of you yeah. can you, certain decisions that have to be made at a higher level. I, and I, I was just going to say that actually everything that you've said has spoken to me as one of those <laughs> stakeholders. I'm like, okay, let go and let God. Okay, <laughs> perhaps that's where I'm at. Who knows? Or is it that you you just have to pace yourself? be measured in your expectations of what actually is going to happen and in what time frame is it going to happen in. And sometimes... All of that. And sometimes, All of that. And sometimes as someone who's passionate in the space that they're in, sometimes you're like, this thing ain't happening fast enough. I, I, you know, this is not happening fast enough. But then you have to kind of, as you said, realis realism has to come in there and you have to kind of say... Okay. And you have to remind yourself why you're in this space, right? Yeah. So that you don't get discouraged. Yeah. So the fact that things aren't going fast enough mm -hmm. um, shouldn't make you abandon the cause. Yeah. Right? Yes, That's yeah. so critical. That don't allow yourself to become so frustrated. So when I say let go and let go, yes, mm -hmm. but not yeah, letting not, it go and not doing it or anything. Mm -hmm. No, you have to continue, as I said, to just monitor and be like, but are you ever going to act on this? We, we, you know, and yeah. don't let them forget. So when they think yeah. it dropped to the wayside, no, I'm going to keep on coming back at you, coming mm -hmm. back at you. But I recognize that I've taken it as far as I can take it, mm -hmm. and you know have to do the next step. But it's yeah. not a sense in which I've disconnected from it. Yeah. I'm going to continue to hold you account in terms of moving forward. But what about the stakeholders that they at the, that we are doing this for in the first place? Because mm -hmm. they're the stakeholders as well too. They're the beneficiaries and stakeholders. The people of Barbados. I mean, what can the people of Barbados do in terms of, well, they can make policy, they can implement policy, but I think it's a, the, the same thing you were talking about, the town hall meetings and the parish yeah. speaks and uh, those kind of things. Uh, and we saw it. We saw it as well with the school nutrition policy, right? Mm -hmm. So um, Health, Heart and Stroke Foundation, Barbados Inc., um, was very much a key stakeholder mm -hmm. in that process and helped with a lot of the work leading up to the nutrition policy. And as part of that, they were engaging with, I mean, I remember going to PTA trainings. Mm -hmm. I mean, before there was even talk of the actual policy being finished, you, yeah. know, the, you know, going to PTA meetings and, um, you know, they're doing vendors training yeah, and, 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 yeah. and, and all of these types of things. Um, and, and just sponsoring little things like showing you how to prepare foods healthier mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, 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 and those sorts of things. And so there's that. So that you have those opportunities, you know, throughout the process, the, there's engagement mm -hmm. of, of individuals. And, and Heart and Stroke Foundation learned from those consultations because people, mm -hmm. you know, 
my experience is different to your experience. So when mm -hmm. I'm looking at a problem, I maybe don't consider all the facets. That's why, mm -hmm. cross, you know, you, yeah. you should not, you know, you try not to just be in a vacuum and analyze mm -hmm. things in a vacuum. You try to get feedback and those sorts of things because it opens your mind to possibilities. And, 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 and sometimes you have preconceived notions. Yeah. So for example, you know, we were, I, I know many people were pleasantly surprised um, with some of the reactions that we got to the school nutrition policies. Mm -hmm. Certain sectors that you maybe thought might have been a little bit more resistant weren't. Yeah. Um, and so it's always important to, to, to get that feedback, feedback. because yeah. then you're able to make more informed choices about how you progress the measure, how you massage the initiative. And so there's not a sense in which, you know, you have to be, you know, some director of something and, mm -hmm. you know, or have some, you know, 20 million degrees after your name to be able to feel like you have a role to play in terms of stating a view. I mean, as I said, we try to be informed views, mm -hmm. right? So you empower yourself in terms of understanding the understand, issue yeah. from legitimate sources, but then you share your views, you know? And I like what you said about not necessarily needing to be a director or whatever. The average person, the mother, the father, those who are concerned about their child's nutrition, the child's health, they have a right to stand exactly. up and say, and, yeah. and the challenges that you face. So, okay, I took my child to school and I think, but this happened. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I'm trying to do this, 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 but I, I'm not able to manage it. And then sometimes what happens is we empower each other, right? So yeah. then I say, but you know what? I had that same problem. And yeah. guess what? I was able to maneuver around it this way. You know? you know what you might find? You might find me at a power speaks next time they come around to say, There you go. Yes, I, I was seeing somebody was saying on Twitter, you know, uh, not Twitter, Facebook, dating myself, eh? Yeah. Um, the, that, wow, you just get a whole lot of information at these power speaks. They say, I, you know, I encourage people to go out to do that as well, kind of a thing. No, it was so, really, I, I've been watching them on TV and actually they're quite interesting and sometimes absolutely hilarious. And I, yeah. I, well, you know, yeah, we yeah. in the Caribbean, what can we say? Yeah, you must have a little bit of, you know, <laughs> laughter and comedy to go along with the serious discussion. Nicole, I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. We went from Same left here. to breath all the way around. As we circle. do, as we Every do. Every single time we have a conversation. So thank you so much for joining us on The Milk of the Matter today. And we hope next time we'll come back and we'll talk about something else, maybe a bit more breastfeeding, a bit more whatever the topic is. I know you'll be willing to come back and have of a course, chat with us. Of course, always. Thanks so much for having me. Happy to be here. Happy to have shared my experience a little bit. Hopefully it is helpful or at least consoling to some <laughs> someone out there who's had a very similar tr struggle to me yeah. uh, as a professional person who is really trying to do their best in mm. terms of breast is best yeah. but face some obstacles along the way that le ultimately led to me having to to just supplement and, and then move on from there so thank you so much for being here nicole thank you to nubian naturals by kelly amory who sponsored this episode of the podcast my name is dr allison bernard Join us on the next episode of The Milk of the Matter.